You're listening to Releasing Trauma, a survivor's podcast. And now here's your host, Tracy Osborne. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. With me today is Jesse Kanzer, and we are talking about the murkiness of rape culture and how we deal with it. You know, um, what was it, 2017, 2018, when the Me Too movement really hit and everybody was talking about it. We were bringing it all to the forefront. And now it's kind of um, died back down a little bit. And, you know, we don't want that momentum that we started to stop. So Jesse is coming on today. We're going to talk a little bit about that. She's a rape survivor who didn't actually acknowledge that she was a rape survivor until many years after the fact, because it was date rape. And I definitely um, know and understand that very well. So Jesse, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on today. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, let's, I, I guess I want to start, you know, a little bit with your, your story. So, um, you know, you're a survivor as well as I am. And, and I too didn't acknowledge that I was a rape survivor until um, several years after the fact, uh, you know, because mine was with my living boyfriend. Mm-hmm. So, um, and this is back in the nineties, you know, you're, you're living with your boyfriend. How can it be rape? Right. Um, exactly. Or, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, unfortunately, that's something that still kind of happens today. Yeah. And, you know, I love that you said the Me Too movement has died down a bit. It has done great things. Don't get me wrong. But oh, yeah. the problem with um, something like the Me Too movement is for the rest of us who are in the more murky area of of uh, being of surviving rape. It's not as black and white. It wasn't necessarily assault. Um, it was sexual assault, but not, it, it was harder to identify. Uh, I think there's a lot of us out there still, and yes, it's still happening today. I'm sure because, because such as the nature of being a woman in the world, but I think there's a lot of us um, uh, of our generation survivors who aren't even sure if it's something we should be talking about because there were some horrible stories that came out. And, uh, you know, my heart continues to be with the people who went through what they went through, who came forth. Yeah. But, but that does not, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I wrote a book called don't just sit there, do nothing, healing, chilling, and living with the doubt aging. And I say in the book, and I tell people that pain is not, a, it's not a comparison type of experience. So just because other people went through some horrible experiences does not mean that we too don't get to talk about and heal from what we went through. I think it's important to remember that rape can look many different ways. And if it doesn't fit the kind of scenario that we're used to hearing about because the sensational scenarios are the ones that get the attention, but all of the scenarios between there and what's normal can sexual sex, they still, they still matter. And the women who are carrying that shame still need to let, learn to let go of it and accept it for what it was, which was non-consent consensual. Absolutely. And you know, what really drives me crazy is how the media will try and downplay it. Um, They'll say, you know, non-consensual sex with a minor or, you know, something like that. And it's like, call it for what it is, you know, name it for what it is. And until we are comfortable, not, well, I don't know that we're ever going to get comfortable with the term, but, you know, until we, you know, stop tippy-toeing around it, um, we're never going to make any great changes. Absolutely. And the other thing is you're talking about, you know, the media, like, like, why does the gray area denomination, like, why does that even exist? Um, I thought about it for a long time. It made me feel more comfortable to say, well, I'm a survivor of gray area rape. Uh, It made me feel more comfortable um, because 
you know, listen, I like, I'm a fun loving person. I, at this point, I'm a happy person. Nobody wants to be like, ah, I want to go and talk about rape. It's not something I want to talk about. It's not something I want to go out and, you know, have nonstop conversations about. However, I am also a mother of two girls. And I feel like once you're a mother of your own girls, you're a mother of all girls. I, it's a responsibility mm-hmm. that I believe that I have. And I'm a writer, so I have a platform. It's something I have to talk about um, in order for me not to feel like a victim. And I think that's what folks have to understand. It's not that I want to go, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Tracy. You don't want to go and be like, yes, let's just talk about rape all day long. However, right, <laughs> right when you take your experience and you use it to to share, to educate, to uplift, to make others feel less alone, that's when you stop being a victim. And mm-hmm. that's why we're here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um <laughs> Sorry, I was about to cough. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, no, I definitely don't, you know, enjoy talking about it. Um, yeah. But like you, I have to talk about it. And I have to talk about it because there are so many out there who can't. Um, either they're they're too afraid to speak up or um, they're no longer with us because of their assault, you know? Uh, so I feel that because I have a voice and I'm not afraid to use it, um, I need to be that voice for those who can't use theirs. And you know what else? And I'm sure this has happened to you. When I started talking about it and just being open about it, I wrote about it. I have a chapter in my book called Penis on Tippy Toes. And um, this chapter talks about the power struggle between men and women and the power struggle in general. Like, I believe in the, the Tao Te Ching teaches, this is this is the philosophy on which I based my book, Don't Just Sit There, Do Nothing. I, um, mm-hmm. uh, I believe that there's a feminine and masculine side in all of us. But it's, so it's not just that, it's not men versus women. It's not like that. It's the thing, the thing that is wrong still in this world is that the feminine side always gets pushed down. The feminine side gets punished. So even in men, that feminine side is always pushed to the corner because it's considered weakness to be soft, to be empathetic. So this struggle is bigger than just men and women. It's this, it's a power struggle. And it's this, um, it's, it's this uh, worshiping of people in power, uh, of people with more money, with more influence, with more with titles and, you know, with bigger platforms. It's that part of our culture that I believe needs to change in order to really change rape culture and, and a lot of other abuses. Absolutely. Totally. Um, you know, why do you think it is that, um, you know, celebrities, for example, you know, obviously they have a bigger platform and people pay attention to them. But, you know, why do they get more, um, I don't want to say publicity, but that really is what it is, than, you know, just everyday people like you and me. You know, why is it that their voices seem to matter more than the rest of us? Well, we, so, I mean, we do, we do worship celebrities, don't we? We, we do. We, yeah. And Listen, I, I, when I, when I hear like, you know, Rosanna Arquette and folks that, um, that have, it's, it's obvious that they struggled a lot within that industry, uh, because they, yeah. that was the amazing part I think that came out with me too, that even though they were celebrities, even though they had seemingly power, they, they were still unable to come out with their story and be validated. Sure. And, uh, you know, because it was because I guess the people who were the perpetrators had more power. And that's what I call the penis and tippy toes. This, it's this like, it's this uh, worshiping of men who really wear their power, like act like an accolade, you know, they, they put themselves they they make themselves grander than they are and then they use their power to abuse others now you know so for me my 
gray area as it's called, which I don't love calling it, but I think it, it, I'm I'm fine with it because maybe it'll help others realize they that they too are gray area rape survivors. Mm-hmm. Because there's such a don't you think it's such a big um it's such a big chasm to go from no, it's fine, everything's fine to going, I'm a rape survivor. Somewhere in between, if you say, you know, I'm a date rape survivor, it kind of it's easier to accept. And uh when I told my story. I had friends uh, say to me, you know, this kind of happened to me. This kind of thing happened to me as well. And more than I thought, that's when I realized, wait, how many of us are, you know, carrying this? Um, And what happened to me was, uh, you know, it's it was in the film industry. Interestingly enough, I was an intern in a film production company and the supervisor. I was very naive at the time. You know, I was. I think 21, 20, 20, almost 21. And I just, um, I would, I had a lot of other things going on. I had a lot of problems, eating disorder, depression. And for me, this film production company was like a lifeline because it was exciting. And I thought, oh, maybe I don't have to do that boring business career path that I wasn't interested in. And maybe there's something else here. So when the supervisor of this company offered to take me for a drink at the end of the internship, and he's like, I will provide for you. Uh, you know, my uh, uh, letter of recommendation. And it just sounded so good. So uh, I also felt stupid afterwards thinking, well, I, you know, I went into this, like I went there. But the, the truth is, if you dissect these situations where we end up having sex without consent, you know, the, he got me super drunk. Uh, he he lied to me as to where he was taking, taking me and... Mm-hmm. You know, I I didn't leave. This is the truth. And I it's still hard to admit that, you know, I did. I did stay there and I didn't leave. But when a when a man who's in a position of power is taking off your clothes and you're crying, you you it's okay that you didn't leave. It's okay that you didn't say no. That is still a non consensual situation. And it took me so many years to realize Hey, I was raped. And mm-hmm. so I'm thinking, and you know, the interesting thing is this man, man and um, the company itself were very, um, very tightly connected to Harvey Weinstein. They actually worked at Miramax and then they started their own company. And I thought, interestingly enough, my own situation is, is also part of this, uh, culture that existed for so long. Right. And when at that time, you know, when I told my mom about it, like nobody said, oh, you know, go to the police. Nobody, Because the truth is, if I went to the police, nothing would have happened because I wasn't assaulted because I went willingly, you know. Yep. And I'm not sure if that has changed. I don't know if a girl in that same situation now, this was 20 years ago. I don't know. I don't know if the police would consider that an assault automatically. I think we still have a lot of work to do before before we're at that point where we have a clear understanding of what's okay and not okay and what is a crime. You know, honest, yeah, I, I mean, I, I I was sitting and trying to think, you know, what would the police do? Um, and, you know, obviously it's a case-by-case situation depending on what cop you get and where you're at and all right. of that, but... Uh, we do have a lot of work to go to do um, a long way to go still, because we are still in the realm of uh, victim blaming. Um, you know, it, it's still, we're not quite as bad as, well, what were you wearing? What were you drinking? But it, it there's cases that can get that bad that it's, you know, it's whatever we're wearing or whatever, you know, our activities were the way we were acting um, we asked for it. Nobody asks to be raped, you know? No. Um, it, that just... and, and like, and, and the, the other thing, you know, why, why should we ever look at what the woman was doing when, when a man obviously, you know, in the situations when a man either used his size or his stature, his power, um, you know, for example, now we know for sure that my situation would not be okay. And in the least, 
I would hope that someone in that situation now would go to somebody in that company and that person would be fired. Uh, I think that at least would happen now, um, which was not, which was not the case back then. Um, But I think that even looking at all of what the women do, you know, and I did this to myself and I know that everybody in, in, of our generation did that to themselves, but what you, instead of looking at what we did wrong, why is it ever okay for a man of power or greater stature to take advantage, to either plot or to just use his size to take advantage of a woman? That should never be okay. No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, when I was raped, um, when I was 18, his excuse was it was his animalistic urges taking over. Hmm. That's still not okay. You know, I, I don't care if you're playing caveman or whatever. Uh, no still means no. Um, you know, they haven't changed the English language and it's not okay. It's not okay to use position of power. It's not okay to use size, you know, and, it's or just, or your animalistic urges. That's not okay. Or and, your animalistic urges. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I had this conversation recently. You know, my kids are so young right now. My daughters are five and seven. And my seven-year-old likes to experiment with the way she dresses. Mm-hmm. And she's super cute. And she has this long blonde hair. She looks nothing like me. <laughs> and um, she wore a, a kind of a belly shirt. Now, there is absolutely, she's the, as innocent as they come. There's nothing in her mind that she's not trying to get any kind of attention. She's experimenting with the way she dresses. Now I told her we can't wear that to school on a weekend. She wore that. And my mom, who's, you know, an older generation, she made a big deal about it. And I said to her, I had this understanding, like this, just uh, this understanding come upon me because I got a lot of a lot of flack for dressing a certain way when I was a teenager. And I said, why can't she wear what she wants to wear? Because she's experimenting with fashion and she wants, you know, why, why the way other people of, of the opposite sex, the way they react or their inappropriateness, why should that cause her to change her behavior? Why? I think it's time for men and people who raise men and people uh, in, in, in positions of, uh, you know, in, in government or people in positions of power at work, I think it's time to understand that, hey, we are not animals and men have to learn to control themselves. It's enough of us. We've been doing this for generations, trying to be more modest, trying to be, you know, appropriate, like enough. I think it's time for men to learn to control those animalistic urges. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. And don't get me started on the school dress code. In fact, I wrote that down just a second ago. I'm like, I've got to do a show on that one because I put four girls through school. My youngest is a, will turn 18 next year. Uh-huh. My oldest is almost 30 and the school dress code. Oh my God. Um, I used to fight with the schools, especially with my youngest, because she is, I mean, she's 17, she's four foot 11 and maybe 80 pounds soaking wet. She is tiny. She is skinny. She is all legs and trying to find clothes that fit this child is near impossible. And, um, you know, one of the things that we thought with was leggings they couldn't wear leggings in school. And I'm like, this is the only thing that fits my child. Are you kidding me? No. I, and if they did wear the leggings, way. they had to wear a shirt that covered their butt. Why? You know? Ugh. Exactly. I, you know, here's my thought. Okay. If a, a, you know, a child in school, I don't care what grade they're in, is wearing something that may cause the males to be distracted or whatever, A, we need to be teaching, um, you know, to stop sexualizing women and females. And B, if this is our teachers, we need to be looking at our teachers because, you know, they shouldn't be having those thoughts at all towards, you know, towards minors. So, you know, (coughs) absolutely, excuse me, absolutely. What we wear should not be a factor in, um, how we are treated. 
Yeah. And, and I thought it was so interesting because, you know, like I'm just starting as a mom to enter that, that kind of thinking. Yeah. I think it's so interesting that power is still uh, unequal and that it more of it lies with men. And yet all of the rules and all of the behavioral conditions are put on us, on women. Mm-hmm. So we have to change. We have to dress appropriately. We have to make sure we're not soliciting any kind of whatever. And uh, no, enough of that. And you know what? I do have friends who are raising boys who are doing amazing jobs. Um, And I believe that that's where the future lies. It's not about limiting our girls. It's about uplifting boys to embrace the feminine side within them as well. And to learn to be softer and to learn to be empathetic and to not be taught this toxic masculinity that other generations grew up with. Uh, Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, it's that intergenerational trauma and it's not going to stop until we stop it. Um, Exactly. This this is why it's it's just going to keep on. Exactly. And that's why, that's why, you know, people like you and I have to get out there and we have to talk about it and we have to bring this aware, this awareness that this is not okay. Um, you know, okay. yeah. And, and, and the, which the reason we're talking about it is because when you, when you own your story, your story stops owning you. I really believe in that. And, oh, yes. and I just, you know, I don't want to carry it anymore. I don't want these secrets, the, the shame. I don't want it. And that's what I encourage others. Look, not everyone wants to do what we do and talk in public, you don't have to, you can mm-hmm. tell, admit, even if you, you admit what happened to you, you, you tell a friend, you tell your significant other, you write it, you just get it outside of yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if, if all you're doing is writing it in a journal or, you know, look in the mirror and just tell yourself, this is what happened to me. You've, you've got to get it out because if we leave it in, it festers. It's like that splinter that we can't get out and it just festers and festers and festers until, you know, one day it explodes. Um, exactly. It's, yeah. that's exactly. That's exactly what happens. And it's, and it's unfair because you know what, the people who did this go on with their lives uh, and yeah. the ones who would happen to have to carry it. Yeah, absolutely. They, um, you know, maybe they get a slap on the hand or, you know, they may spend some time in jail and everything. And that's great. But and yeah. that's, that's given that's if you ever did anything about if it, if you, you know, do anything about it. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that's a whole other topic right there. You know, a lot of times we don't do anything about it because we don't want to go through the whole trial and everything. Um, you know, it's and embarrassing. So young. It's shaming. I mean, it had, yeah. And, and like you were young, I was young when you're so yeah. young, ugh, you don't want, you just want to, you want to forget about it. Yeah. Yeah, just sweep it under the cover. In fact, I actually blocked it out for um, probably about six months after it happened. I w- I just totally forgot about it. And then one day I woke up and I was just like, holy crap. And I called up my best friend. I was like, dude, I was right. She goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. she goes, but I, I know that you had blacked it out or blocked it out. And so I wasn't going to say anything until mm-hmm. you were ready. And, you know, because we were just so close. Um so she just knew, you know, yeah. it, but, you know, so yeah, that's, you know, if we remember what happened and then we have that's to go through the whole, thing. his word against her yeah. word. Well, and- you, the memory thing, this is what I don't think people who this hasn't happened to, they don't understand. Look, I have a really, really good memory. I can't to this day, remember the name of that internship supervisor. I know the company, the film company, I'm sure if I wanted to, which I don't go through the rigmar- rigmarole, I think I'm sure I could find it. Um, I don't even remember the name and that's not like me. I remember things. I blocked so mm-hmm. much of those parts out of that night. And you, you know, like this is, this is our self-protection mechanism. That's what, that's what happens. And I don't think people quite understand it because do you remember the whole case that happened with, um, Oh God, I just blacked out on the name. Um, Are you talking about, um, um, was it Christine something? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I was thinking about her earlier, and I'm like, oh gosh, I want to mention her, but I can't remember her name. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the one who testified against the um, the Supreme well, Court judge. 
Yes. And this was, by the way, re-traumatizing, I think, for a lot of us. So I'd, oh, I, yes. I, it's a coincidence, by the way, that we, um, Dr. Christine, ugh, forgot. Sorry. Sorry, Christine. <laughs> but I think, I think it's a very traumatizing uh, uh, thing to watch on television for, for a lot of us. And and then you, you know, I would flip the channels and I would hear like Fox News anchors say, well, like, she can, she doesn't, re- you know, well, what kind of person doesn't remember that? No, the, the thing that is missing is this understanding that when a traumatic event happens to you, your brain goes into protection mode in order to protect you. It really does block some of those memories. It does. I know, it, 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 I know it happened to me. That's why I know that yeah. what you're saying was so spot on. Yeah, and oh, absolutely. Well, and it's, it's, it's Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. I had to look it up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was driving me nuts. You know, um, the, the, my second rape, I don't remember any of it. I don't have a clue what happened. Um, and a lot of that, well, most of that was probably because I had blacked out because I'd been drinking. And I don't remember the name of the guys that I was with. And I knew who they were. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you today who they are. Um, they could walk up to me on the street and I'd be like, I don't know who you are. Um, that's you know, and, and that's just how our brains work. Yeah. And, and it's unfortunate. Um, yeah, I also had been drinking at that time, but I also suspect, um, and I wrote this in my book. Um, I suspect that there was something put in my drink. I would never know at this point. Um, perhaps, perhaps I was also very small at the time and not eating much. So per, perhaps because it, I only had two drinks, but I did black out. Um, but, you know, I will never know. And that's OK. It doesn't matter because I realize I don't need to know those details because right. it doesn't matter. Either way, it was not OK. Exactly. Right. It doesn't make it any better. Um, no, it, it's in not fact, okay. it makes it worse. Like it, right. It, right. It doesn't. Right. Whether it was because you know, you were plied with drink or you, it doesn't matter or whether you were drunk because it, all of those mm-hmm. things, still, there's so much deconditioning we have to do oh, <laughs> to take yes. the blame from the victim. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jesse, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, ladies out there listening, definitely go grab Jesse's book. Don't just sit there, do nothing. And make sure you visit Jesse on the web at jessiecanzer.com. I will have all of her contact information in the show notes so you can reach her there. But Jesse, thank you so much. I I mean, you know, we could talk about this for hours and barely touch the tip of the iceberg. You know, thank you, Tracy. I'm just glad we got to share, you know, I got to share my story and you shared yours and hopefully that encourages people to let go of carrying their shame and their stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, it all comes down to it's not your fault. Absolutely. And, and, and when you let go of that, you will be free. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the day that I, I realized, you know, that it wasn't my fault and I was able to let go. Um, the weight just flew off my shoulders. It's an amazing feeling. It really is. So, well, Jesse, thank you again. And listeners, thank you for tuning in and we will talk to you in the next show. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss a show. Be sure to check us out on our new socials on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.